Thanks for the person that said good morning. Um, for the record, my name is Tanya Fernandez Anderson, District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded. It is being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Files Channel 964. The council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April and running through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can do this in several ways. Attend one of our hearings and give public testimony. We will take public testimony at each departmental hearing and also at two hearings dedicated to public testimony. The full hearing schedule is on our website, boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Our scheduled hearings dedicated for public testimony uh, was on April 26 at 6 p.m. and the following at, on June 2nd at 6 p.m. You can give testimony in person here in the chamber or virtually via Zoom. For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up on the sheet near the entrance. For virtual testimony, you can sign up using our online form or on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name, affiliation, and or residence, and limit your comments to two minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. Email your written testimony to the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov or submit a two-minute video of your testimony through the form on our website. For more information on the City Council budget process and how to testify, please visit the City Council's budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on dockets 0480-0482, orders for the FY23 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for the post-employment benefits OPEB. Docket 0483, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations, docket 0484-0486, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Docket 0500, for order for the PEG access fund. Our focus area for this hearing will be Department of Innovation and Technology, do it, do it PEG access fund. Our panelists for today's hearings are Santiago Garces, Chief of Innovation and Technology, Sarah Figueroa, Chief of Staff, Do It, Zachary Lax, Interim Director of Operations, Do It, Mike Lynch, Chief of Broadband and Digital Equity, Do It. I am joined by my colleagues, Councillor Liz Braden, District 9, Councillor President Ed Flynn, District 2, Councillor Kenzie Bach, District 8, and I uh, have a couple of absence letters from Councillor Murphy and Councillor Lujen, which I will read uh, before the end of this hearing. Um, just so that you get a, uh, you're familiar with the format, we I will be asking um, a set of questions after your presentation. You'll get approximately. Uh, I guess five minutes each, uh, 20 minutes total to present. Um, and then we'll go into questioning. Each counselor will be given eight minutes. It's up to them to monitor how they uh, question uh, or receive answers. Um, and you'll hear a timer go off when their, their time is up. Then we'll go to second round and we will uh, leave, today we will leave um, public testimony for last. Without further ado, um, if you don't mind, before you present, uh, state your name again and affiliation, obviously, your uh, titles um, for the record, and you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. 
So we'll do a quick round of introductions and then we'll jump into the presentation. So I'm Santiago Garces. Um, I'm the new chief information officer for the city of Boston. And a quick introduction because this is my first time in front of the council. Um, I'm originally from Colombia, but I've had the pleasure of serving uh, previously as executive director of community investment in South Bend, also as CIO of the city of Pittsburgh and as CIO of the city of South Bend as well. So uh, I'm really excited and honored to be in Boston working with you all. Hi, um, my name is Sarah Figalora. I am the chief of staff of the Department of Innovation and Technology. I've been in this role for about a year and three months. Pass it to Zach. Zach Lax, Interim Director of Operations. I've been with Do It for just over two years. Uh, Mike Lynch from the Broadband and Cable Office and Do It. Great. So I've been on the job for three weeks, so uh, whatever I'm about to share is both education for me, but I know that there's uh, some members of the public and new council members, so um, I wanted to share a little bit of an uh, overview of what Do It does, and um, I know that the a topic of high concern for the council and for the community and for the mayor is digital equity, so we'll cover that as well. Uh, let me see if this thing's working. I don't think it's working. There you go. Right. Thanks, council. Okay, yeah, I can, I can stand a little bit, too. Nothing like having some technology issues on the technology <laughs> budget presentation. So, right, thank you very much. So, um, an important thing to understand about Do It is that it is a shared service provider. So, we do a lot on some services. We provide some services for every single employee um, in the city. On, on other services, we only provide certain, we only cover certain departments. So um, we provide a analytics, so our analytics team makes sure that we are managing and, and analyzing data that the city produces through its operations, helping us make better decisions. Digital services manages Boston.gov and kind of the footprint that what a lot of our constituents access when they, when they interact with us digitally. Enterprise applications runs a subset of applications that are really critical for the operation of the city as a whole. And in some sense, like if you think about do its logo on the website, which is an on-off button, it really, if the technology that underlies processes like payroll, uh, paying our vendors, budgeting, don't work reliably, it's very disruptive for the city. So I think it's a, it's a nice icon to represent us. Um, we also run infrastructure and we manage um, the core fiber network that connects all city facilities and in the process of expanding to cover really all of the city facilities uh, as well as our wicked free Wi-Fi service. Um, we have the broadband cable and digital equity group that administers the franchise agreements and also the licensing agreements with the, with the telecommunications carriers. and leverages the funds that are generated through those agreements to reach uh, important goals of digital equity. And last but not least, cybersecurity. So as we know, there's a heightened um, importance in making sure that all of the data and all of the assets that we have at the city, both for the employees, for the students, and for the constituents, is done securely. Oh. So, just broadly, this, and this is an older version of the, of the org chart, uh, but I didn't know better when I put it in. But yeah, we just wanted to show that for how for some departments, we really do provide all of the services. So we administer and, and provide the laptops and PCs and computers that they use. In some cases, we manage and administer the applications that they use. For instance, with the city council, we administer Granik as the legislative management system. Uh, we also help manage the, the devices, make sure that the network in these buildings are, are operating. In other places like the, with the schools, there's kind of a shared services model where we provide the base connectivity, 
but the schools have their own data centers and they have like all of the devices that the students use are managed by, by technology groups within that group. So just so that you know that our, our budget basically comprises some core pieces, but it doesn't give you the full view of all of the technology expenditure and all of the things that are happening throughout the city. Just quick numbers, and we'll glance over this, but just we wanted to share some of the assets that are, we're stewards of these assets. Again, like the other pieces, like our budget is not really our, you know, these are not DeWitt's computers, they're the department's computers. They're the computers that enable all of the operations of the city. Uh, they just happen to be on our spreadsheet, on our, on our, on our balance sheet, if you will. So, uh, you know, we manage um, about five, th almost 6,000 cell phones, about um, six, five, 5,400 uh, desktops and laptops. Uh, we manage about 250 wicked free Wi-Fi access points, and we're in the process of expanding the, the availability of, we, of the free Wi-Fi. Uh, we manage about 327 uh, facilities that are connected to this core wi a fiber network, and there's more that are being added. Um, we manage 2.5 petabytes of storage. Just for context, a petabyte is a million megabytes. It's a, it's a lot of storage. Uh, and again, we, in that case, are the stewards. It's not our, it's not DUID's documents, it's not DUID's data. It's everybody, like all of the city's data and information from employees, from departments, and, and whatnot. Uh, same thing, we manage 761 virtual servers. The bulk of those servers are maintaining applications for different departments. Um, obviously, cybersecurity, we manage and, and monitor about 24,000 active user accounts. Uh, so it's not only the city staff, but vendors and other people that have access to some of our systems for the performance of the work. Um, again, analytics, we have a very mature uh, data analytics environment that, that manages and, and, and shares data from different departments and different places of the city uh, and leverages them for making better decisions. We have 11 million visitors in Boston.gov last year. So, and we have so an award-winning website, the, uh, the, the envy of many other municipalities. I know because I used to be one of them. Um, we process about 4,000 online payments per month through the uh, platforms that we support and about 80,000 um, permit applications last year. So that's just a brief overview and just so that you get a context. Again, when you're looking at our budget, if you look at items, that's why like certain items like enterprise applications or infrastructure are fairly large because they cover the footprint of the entire department. Other areas of the budget around uh, devices and device management are a little bit smaller, but it's also because it's not the full picture of, of everybody in, in, the, in the city. So knowing that digital equity is at the forefront of the conversation, just in the brief interactions that I've had with, with some of the council members and with the mayor and with other members of the community. And what's important to know, to think about digital equity is that this is an issue that's been changing really rapidly and that has, the way that we talk about it and the way that we think about it has changed dramatically thanks to the pandemic. So before the pandemic, and we've, I've been working in this space for, for a while, I know Mike and other people have been working on it for even longer. In the past, digital equity was something that people cared about, but it wasn't essential, right? Like people are like, it's important, but you know, it would, there's other things that were perhaps more important. And during the pandemic, digital tools what, is what kept us safe, is what enabled people to be able to continue operating, to continue to go to school, to continue to do work in a safe manner. And all of a sudden, digital connectivity and access to broadband became a matter of, an essential matter of being able to be a member of society, of working, of, and of studying. So again, we know that there are certain things that have been changing and, and driving in the past couple of years, telecommuting, remote instruction, telehealth. Um, 
there's some big concerns around affordability, and obviously we think about like families that are already burdened with uh, with being able to make ends meet with housing, with food, with other bills. And we know that, again, in the past, people and families have had to make tough decisions around whether to uh, access broadband and to, to pay for broadband. Um, and the last piece, it's, this is a rapidly changing problem. And you know, like when we think about what is the new normal, things haven't stabilized yet. And maybe there won't be a, a stable environment in the sense that People are, some people are working remotely. Some, uh, you know, like some organizations are still trying to figure out whether they work in a hybrid environment. And I know that the city and the schools and, and other groups experience these kinds of questions. And this is important because it translates into everything that we do. When we have to support students that are doing remote instruction or hybrid instruction, where some students are in the classroom and some students are at home, it completely changes the way that some of our network and some of our kind of pieces of infrastructure were originally designed to work. And it's fine, but we just need to keep adapting to the changing needs. Try to be quick. So um, really quickly, and before covering the content of this, this is important, again, partly because the problem evolves so quickly. And in the past two years, in the past three years, We've experienced nothing short of kind of like a revolutionary crisis when it comes to the changes in needs and, and kind of the landscape around digital equity. A lot of the data that we have doesn't move as quickly as, as the issue. Um, uh, the American Community Survey, which is administered by, by the federal government, gives us a five-year rolling average of, of some of these issues. And I guess the, the data is, but it's the best data that we have. The, the map that you see gives us an indication per census track of areas where um, there's households that don't have access to broadband. So again, it's just going in and knowing. We know that digital equity is an issue. It remains an issue. About 13% of households are estimated not to have access to broadband. They're not distributed equally across the entire city. Um, and the issues around why they're not connected vary. Uh, there's issues of, of affordability, there's issues of bandwidth, um, you know, like I know that having conversations, like brief conversations with uh, Councilman Flynn and with the mayor, there's a very vivid image in people's mind around people that have kids or, or that have friends that have kids during periods of remote instruction, having a classroom of kids in Zoom where some of the kids particularly likely low-income kids in, that, live, that come from communities of color, immigrants, that they couldn't, the other students couldn't see or that they, the other students couldn't hear clearly because the connectivity was spotty. And it might not be a lack of access, like there was service to that home, but it's an issue around bandwidth, the ability of the, the student to be able to share and transmit their, their, their image and whatnot. And, that's where things that are technical and economic and regulatory issues become you know, equity issues and issues that are very real for families. And you know, not being able to be literally seen in a classroom by your peers is, so is I just want to acknowledge that. So we know that it is important. We know that there's work to be done. Um, but th there's some good news, and there's things that have been changing and there's a lot of work that do it and Mike and the team have done in the past couple of years and I'll briefly cover that and there's some things that are game changers that have been happening at the federal level so as part of the American Rescue Plan ARPA the federal government created a new program called Affordable Connectivity Program and the program gives families I think for up to four years $30 per month in discount to their internet service provider if they qualify and they've been expanding eligibility. Um, it also gives the families a $100 rebate on a device to be able to purchase a device if the device is, is, is part of the gap. Uh, so far in Boston, we've enrolled 23,000 households. Just so you get a sense of the magnitude 
this equates to about $10 million worth of benefits. It's $10 million of digital equity that otherwise we would have had to figure out how to, where to find the funding for, that the federal government is providing. And that funding is going to be recurring at least for the next four years. So again, it's not mission accomplished, but it does make, the, it's leveraging federal funds in a way that, that is really significant. We're also expanding wicked free Wi-Fi and if you look at the previous um, slide, the, the little red dots are where we have the wicked free Wi-Fi access points. Um, Excuse me, Mr. Garces. Um, just a fair warning, you have six minutes left out of the 20 minutes for the entire panel. Yes. So I, is your, are you giving the presentation for both? For I, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving the presentation. So I'll, okay. and we, Chair, hopefully, I'll, I'll speak quickly and hopefully <laughs> no, it does. No, you no, don't, you don't have to rush. I just wanted to get an idea yeah. of what was happening. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I uh, fortunately or unfortunately d decided that it'd be easier if I just tried One to take the presentation person. out, but Got we'll it. definitely leverage the team to answer questions that uh, prove a little tricky. Um, and again, a lot of the work that we do, we do through partnerships, working with a number of uh, groups and entities, and some are maybe less popular, and maybe we're part of the problem as we understand it, the, with the carriers and the telecommunications providers, but the reality also, they've been partners for us and provided a lot of resources to address these issues as well. A quick timeline, so, um, because it's something that I know that has come up in, in other forums. Um, this, we responding to digital equ equity has been a moving target, but the reality is we've, we've had basically a plan that has been evolving based on the context and on the need. So initially between 2020 and 2021, we were responding to the initial pandemic, right? This is when people had to go home. And I know I've heard, I experienced this in Pittsburgh, but I've heard similar stories here in Boston of uh, the, the team do it, pulling off heroic efforts to make sure that employees had devices, that the students have devices and Wi-Fi and you know, shifting large amounts of funding to be able to accomplish that. So that's kind of like the initial phase is just, responding to this rapidly changing environment. Um, secondly, is the phase that we currently are on. Uh, we're, we've been assessing digital equity and through the efforts of the council and, the, and, and, and of the administration, we are in the process of finalizing an assessment of digital equity in the city. The assessment is in the final stages. We're just reviewing the final drafts and we hope to be able to present it to the public and to the council uh, soon. And we, we think that the timing of this is good because the, about three weeks ago, only three weeks ago, the federal government issued guidance around how the funding for digital equity that was a, appropriated as part of the, the, the infrastructure bill IIJ, um, how those funds are going to be available. So with the assessment, with the data that we have from the assessment, we'll, we're in a position to work with the state to craft the digital equity plan and the requests that we'll be making of the federal government to, oh, so, go, so go to the next slide, um, to be able to leverage the, the federal funding. Again, the, addressing digital equity is an expensive proposition and it it's one that we are it's in our interest and I think the interest both like the fiscal interest of the city and just of the magnitude of the issue of leveraging as much as we can le federal funds so we've been positioning ourselves to be able to leverage those funds um, and again we know that there's a fair amount of, of work there are some challenges and some constraints around what we existing what, what we have currently um, so our fiber network Bonet is an incredible asset, and it also is an asset that was provided by the city, uh, again, as someone who comes from a different place. This is, Boston got an incredible deal of being able to leverage fiber optic from the cable providers, from Comcast and from Verizon and from Crown Castle for free to build, a, basically the, to receive the fiber to do whatever you want. 
except the agreement that, that gave us those fiber assets restricts the usage of the fiber to non-commercial use. So basically just, as I know that there's conversations and thoughts that are coming, but when we say that we need to start from a clean slate, it means that those assets that we currently have cannot be leveraged to do other forms of solutions that involve requiring payment from the uh, from users. So uh, I'm sure that maybe there's some questions around that. Um, but that's that's it for for the presentation. We have some more information if it comes during the questions. But um, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Garces. Appreciate you. Um, you spoke to engaging, um, empowering, and improve life for residents in the city uh, through technology. Can you can you describe again um, exactly what that looks like? Yeah. So it looks, and and I, uh, I'll give my stab at the question and then uh, defer to the team. But it looks in a number of different ways, right? So we have. We support the underlying technology that empowers the school. So, right, like our, our user base, if you will, encompasses, we enable the employees that deliver the services that employees, that the residents care about, right? Like we, we are not doing the ass assessments. We are not immigrant services. We're not, a, you know, some of the offices that do really important work, but we enable those employees to have tools that enable digital communication so both have content on the on Boston.gov so that a resident that might be looking for those services know that those services exist. Enable the communication, the infrastructure so that those residents and those, those offices can communicate with each other. So um, for instance, we are providing the technology for the Office of uh, Police Accountability and Transparency so that they can do their work. Um, and with some groups like the schools, again, the, they're large number of users, 60,000 students uh, about. Um, we provide the basic infrastructure that connects the schools and also when the students are accessing resources from the schools from outside, we are maintaining the infrastructure that is invisible. You know, the internet's also a physical thing. We provide and maintain the infrastructure on our end of, of the piece. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Um, so your page talks about, um, and, I, and I, I think it does, thank you, um, that Boston needs to be a place where everyone has options for affordable, fast broadband. Um, do you think that that's the case with this department currently, or are, would you say that you're working toward it, or are you doing that now? Yes, so um, this, this is what the assessment that I was uh, discussing about, so I'll, I'll, I'll share with you some items that are in the assessment. Obviously, if you want the full data and be able to peel in, the, the assessment will provide more uh, information. Boston is currently covered, 100% of residents have, this. Boston, Boston's cur currently covered by two major providers, Comcast and Verizon. Comcast provides connectivity throughout the entirety of the city. There's no area within the city where a resident couldn't request. I'm just talking about access, not necessarily about whether that, you know, like when we think about equity, it's not only do you have access, are you actually in a position to be able to use it? So I just wanna make sure that that's clear. Um, Verizon started, uh, the, the agreement with Verizon to let them build their fiber network and their, uh, started in 2016. So Verizon has almost near um, coverage in the city. The last pieces that haven't been developed are close to the area, close to downtown and Chinatown where I live. Uh, that, those area, but f like 78% of the city is covered with Verizon as well. So to the question, do people, and there's other providers, uh, NetBlazer and Starry that also provides other options for, for connectivity. So. On the question of accessibility, Boston generally fares better than most places, and for the most part, you can find options for for provider. That's restricted, you get one level in. If you live in an apartment building, your landlord sometimes restricts who, whether multiple providers can get in, and that's, you know, that's another layer. Affordability is a big issue, right? And in the past, affordability has been at the crux of 
well, even if you have access, can you afford the, the service? And that's where the, the funding from the federal government has really made a big dent in it. But again, thinking about equity, it's still a little bit of a hassle to go through. And the city has no power to affect this. So it's a relationship between the, the federal government and the providers to get that discount. But what we've been doing is focusing our efforts to make sure that people know that the benefit exists and is available. So there are the succinct answer to your question is there are challenges. What the assessment generally points at is the challenges that exist around being able to provide access to truly everyone are become more pinpointed and more specific around specific constituents, around specific communities, around specific issues. Some people don't want broadband and we want to understand why they don't want broadband, because they don't see the value in it, is it because they don't, they would like it, but there's something about it that they, you know, like they might feel intimidated because they don't speak English and they, you know, like the, the hassle of setting up service. So. There's work to be done to really get to kind of universal coverage, but generally the city has some strong foundations across the board, and in terms of accessibility, it is doing better than, it's definitely doing better than it was 10 years ago. Thank you. Um, so would you say that we, have, we haven't established that? We, it's, a, it's not, it's a no. It's not happening yet. It's not happening. Is that the current situation? The, can you the question that I yeah, asked sorry. you about, oh, okay, um, about Boston um, giving people affordable and ac access and access to fast broadband. To, ac the, to the answer to access, the answer is yes. The question around equitable use, like going through Oh, that wasn't the my question. Okay, then to access is for the most part, there is access. If people chose it, they and they could afford it. There is access to internet service providers. That's what the that's what the assessment shows. There, but if you can't afford it, therefore not accessible. Sorry. If you can't afford it, then then therefore not accessible. Technically not accessible. Well, that's why I was qualifying it, right? Like because when you start. The, I just wanted to make sure we're on the same page. Like that I do that that the answer was a no. Yeah. Not okay. yet. <clears throat> yeah. We're working on it. Well, yes, and. I just want to be careful because the terminology, and there's, it's not you, it's just like what the federal government uses. Access is usually the ability, if you chose to get a subscription versus usage, which was the higher bar that you're pointing out, which is attaining. Think, which is using, you know, like actually being able to meaningfully, if you choose so. Thanks to for be able breaking to choose. that down to okay. Mr. Garces. Um, in terms of your top 10 salary earners, you only have one person that is black in your department, and then nine white, a total of 10. 90% white is your top salary. Do you know what is the demographic of your entire department? So I would say the data that you have is not accurate, because it's, yeah, yeah. You, you gave it to me. Yeah, no, but let me, <laughs> let me qualify that. The data that you have is outdated, because it does not reflect, I will tell you that I, did not identify as some of the the um, categories that you that you have in, and I know that there's other uh, you don't members that identify that be, yourself as and white neither or black. white nor black. I see. Um, you identify. You ident what, I'm sorry. What 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 is your identity? Oh. If it's if you're comfortable. Yeah. No. I uh, well, it's a complicated question. You're, um, I, I'll tell you. It's okay. It's okay if you don't. No, no, no. I, I'm happy to. But somehow to answer. they clumped you in there. I am. I'm, is no, that what you're so the, this is why I was saying that it is outdated because it does not reflect. Like, and I know that there's other people that it wouldn't reflect. It's not an issue with the the data is accurate as of the time. I think like it says like as of April. Um, there's a disclaimer there. That's if okay. You're, we'll, if you're, we'll make it 20 percent BIPOC. What what about? But what about? What are we doing to? to change that? Do you think that's a well, good state to be in? Yeah, no, so I, well, again, so I, because the data does not reflect me, it also does not reflect uh, my values and my decision making as a, the, as a department head. And the answer to your question is no, I think that we have much better teams and much better decision making when we have diverse people. And I would like to think 
I would like to think that I'm a great CIO because I am a great CIO, <laughs> because I'm a great technologist and I understand the business and I'm caring and I'm a great strategist. But I'm also, I also bring my experience as an immigrant, as someone whose English is not his first language, uh, as someone who has a complex view of his own race and identity. So the answer to you is there is work to be done and we, uh, I'm three weeks in, so I'm hoping that get a little bit of leeway to be able to do some of that work, but yes, we need to bring, and I would also I qualify. Wrap, and I have to wrap up my, my time. Yes, ma'am. Because I have to uh, allow my colleagues mm -hmm. to ask, ask the questions. Um, my question was more about what are we doing to fix it, to fix the problem of diversity? Yeah, just so you don't hear from me, Zach can. Uh, so obviously, uh, we've made some progress. Excuse me, I forgot to introduce myself. Zach Lax, Interim Director of Operations. So we've made some progress in increasing the diversity of the department. Tangible steps that we have taken include actually developing a strategic HR function, which we did not have prior to this fiscal year. Um, that, that is head up for our, by our Director of HR. It includes our Talent Acquisition Manager, who will be onboarding hopefully soon uh, once we finish recruiting candidates. So as, as a foundation, we've established a function for diversity recruitment to take place, and now it's a matter of building on the other efforts. So cross-training programs that we have in pilot, um, working on developing pathways for diverse candidates through our recruitment portal, um, and then in general, as I said before, making sure that, again, there is a strategic person dedicated to recruitment and staffing in a way that has not existed in the department before. And I think some of that progress is reflected in the numbers that we see from this year as compared to last. I think that the progress you would see if we do the refresh and you looked at the numbers that you have currently with the numbers as they are today, you start seeing the needle moving in the right direction. Thank you. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all for being here and welcome to Boston. Three weeks on the job. <laughs> um, wish you all the best. Thank you. Um, one issue that we're interested in is the issue around data analytics, because you know, if we, in order to plan good city services and intervene when things are not doing so well, is we need good data. Um, I was just wondering, uh, in terms of the resources that you have, it seems like the data analyt analytics program is is sort of slim, let's say. Um, and um, whether or not you have enough resources to actually do a good job. And do you provide data analytics for departments across the board, or is it just for within, within your own sphere? Yeah, so um, at the risk that Stephanie are really amazing chief data officers in the galleries, but I'll give you my, my take on the, on, the, um, on the question. So we have generally the budget, again, I, I've been here three weeks, I did not put the budget. It's a good budget. It's a budget that generally allows us to keep the lights on. And as I, the point of the conversation is, it's an important, they're important lights to keep on. Yes, absolutely. Um, the, on the analytics side, we mostly, right now the current makeup, the, the core data team that Stephanie manages is composed of some data engineers, performance management, and data analytics. We have, Boston has an amazing enterprise data management tool that is fairly matured. That's the numbers that you see around the number of data sets that are being pulled mm -hmm. out. Um, there's other functions even within Do It, like GIS, that does some data functions. Um, so if you were to look, you know, like for instance, the $800,000 that we spend on our enterprise agreement with Esri, you could somehow conceive that also to be part of the data spend. Um, there are other groups, my understanding, this is three weeks in, but my understanding is that there's different groups that, you know, police has a dedicated analytics group that does the analytics around like crime prevention and like policing strategies. The schools have analytics groups. Uh, the BPDA has a really great research group I'm kind of jealous. I used to do the equivalent of VPDA in South Bend, and that's an amazing team. So uh, the reality is like most of the focus of our analytics ends up being on the operational side and generally more aligned towards the departments where if you go back to the um, kind of chart of the, the, the organizational chart, mostly with the departments where we provide kind of that full stack of services. Um, but 
hopefully that's just the beginning. And one of the main things that we've been starting to talk about is, you know, thinking about Mayor Wu's call to bring City Hall out of City Hall. How do we bring city data out of City Hall to help empower, you know, like empower kids, uh, enable people to feel more connected with what's happening at the city? So in terms of, you said that, you know, um, the question about your the relationship with BPDA, mm -hmm. do, you, do, you, do you have your own mapping capacities or do you share that capacity with the BPDA? And also in terms of uh, the mapping, um, you know, is this Carolyn Bennett is the GIS director for the city of Boston. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is that, does that role, is that come out of your budget or does it come out of BPDA? She's in our budget. So the way that GIS works is there's an enterprise agreement that covers all of the city departments. Central Do It covers about half of it, about, so it's a 1.5 roughly million dollar um, agreement out of which 800,000 come out of Do It. The central GIS function is out of Do It, so Carolyn reports to, well right now she reports to me because there's no enterprise application uh, officer. Um, and, but we share, so to some extent we share data and in some sense we share processes, some of those processes cover across the board. So like for instance when a new street, uh, when there's new development and a street address needs to be created, it covers people in public works, the police department, the PDA, um, and, and us as well. So we have kind of like the global visibility, but the process kind of touches a touches little bit. Touches different of departments. Yeah. So, you know, the mapping and geospatial piece of it and connecting, like one concern we have is that um, sometimes departments don't have access to all the information. So if you're trying to solve a problem or get to the bottom of something, you have to go to, you have to go all over the place to try and get, get the information. Uh, um, you know, from your perspective, do you think that having a having a, a centralized data analytics platform for the whole city that that would be um, that every department would would work with is, does that seem more conducive to better coordination? Like even within the schools, like they have they, they have to to follow they, they use different. Um, different platforms to follow student progress, mm -hmm. but if it was all in one space, you could you could follow student progress from birth to when they graduate from college sort of thing, you yeah. know. Um, it's just trying to, you know, we, we break it up and chop it up until it just looks like, yeah, it's, there's very, it's very difficult to get good information. That is one thing, information's another. <laughs> 100% agree, and that is reflective of process, so a lot of times if you don't have very good process, the data is not gonna be particularly good. Um, there's, there's work to be done. There's some good foundational elements, but there's a lot that needs to be done around training and enablement, and it goes a little bit to the chair's question around how do we kind of come true about like building up diversity and capacity across the, the yeah. not only my department, across the city, better training, better access to opportunities for people. So there's there's work to be done in that space, but there's some really strong foundations in the city too that will make that possible. That's good. And um, and you bring your experience from other cities as well, so that's 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 good. I think we, we can learn from what others, other people's mistakes and other people's good solutions, so that's great. And um, you know, back to digital equity, the affordability issue is critical. Like I, I did office hours last week and we had an elder come in and, and really, talk to us about the, the challenges of the, the cost of broadband. Um, many elders do, they do telehealth now uh, in COVID, the, the, their, um, uh, and fixed income challenges. How the federal, this pro program has been rolled out like for 10 months, and you think there's about 20,000 folks have availed of it. Uh, is, what's, the ben, what's the threshold for being able to participate in that? Like it's, it's $30 a month discount. Um, for four years, um, what's the tre income threshold to get to get access to that? I'll defer to Mike Lynch on this one. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yes, Councillor. Um, there are actually about eight different buttons that could be pushed: uh, public housing, SNAP eligibility, Medicaid, um, WIC, 200% uh, of the poverty level. Um, but the process is complicated, and it requires two steps. And it is a fabulous program. I don't mean to, to 
undermine the program at all. It's $14 billion. As Santi said, right now, $10 million of that money is coming into the city to afford connectivity for 23,000 families. That's, that's a $10 million contribution in this city. Mm -hmm. And I think we can do more. I think the problem with the account was they never, uh, the FCC never just sort of had a, like a marketing budget. So it, it falls to us in the city to educate people how to do it and to, in many cases, help them write the application to fill out the form to get this service, which will last probably four or five years. And at that point, I suspect, will be continued. I'm not sure it'll be yeah. an entitlement, but the benefit will probably continue. So are you, are you working with like groups like Age Strong to try and get, yes. get it out to? Age Strong, Public Housing. Uh, Peter then, Favorito, who is our new digital equity advisor, he used to be staff here in the city council, is I think today heading out to Charlestown. He was in Grove Hall two weeks ago, and he does two or three of these a week. And we you. hope that our digital equity fund, which is in the budget, uh, will um, will fund outreach through nonprofits, churches, and community-based organizations okay. in the next year, not to provide hotspots or connections in homes but rather to help people get signed up. It's a little complicated, and that's kind of our goal for yeah. the next few months. Yeah. Uh, our office will follow it, up with it, you to I, get more information. It, it, if I may, I don't know if I'm, I'm running over or what, but uh, the chair mentioned something that was uh, spot on. You said that uh, if it is not affordable, it is not accessible. That is absolutely correct. The affordable connectivity program helps people get connected, but it's kludgy and it's awkward and it requires a bit of a lift by us, I guess. Yeah. Um, much of the other funding, say $42 billion worth of funding that is going through the NTIA over at the Department of Commerce, we lobbied very heavily. Uh, when I say we, I mean the, the city of Boston, other cities, associations that work with cities, the National League of Cities, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, National Association of Telecommunications Offices, we pleaded that affordability be considered a factor. Unfortunately, it was not. It does not mean we won't get any of that money, but it doesn't put us at the front of the line. It kind of puts us at the back of the line. Uh, the NTIA money, the big pot of money, uh, federal money, the $42 billion, is really designed for rural America, and we kind of lost that. We have the Affordable Connectivity Program. We'll get something out of the, the BEAD program, it's called, the, the Equity and Access Program, but we're not sure exactly what that is. The rules just got issued uh, last week, still wading through them, you know, and hopefully we'll have better answers for you shortly. Okay. Uh, our office will follow up with you and see how we can help disseminate you, that information. Yeah, if we can, we'd love to partner with the council members to share the information, you know, that when constituents reach about the affordable connectivity program so that you can share with your constituents as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor President Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the DUA team that's here and for the important work that you're doing, and also to the DUA team that's in the audience as well. Thank you for, thank you for the important work here. Um, this is an issue I've focused on with my colleagues, with, with Mayor Wu, uh, for a number of years. We have a lot of money coming into the city from the federal government on digital equity, but I'm still disappointed that persons with disabilities, seniors, immigrants, residents in BHA, communities of color, constituents that live in high-rise um, high type buildings um, still don't have the same equal access as residents in other areas. And I, I say that because I've had students that weren't able to fully participate in their studies because they weren't able to have the right broadband, the right power um, during the school year. Only one child, one student was able to be on the system at, this, at one time. So it wasn't working for my constituents in Chinatown, many of them immigrants. Um, many of them seniors as well, but you go, um, you know, a half, a half a mile away up to um, 
other areas of this of the of the city in wealthier areas and and it is working um, so I I say that because you know I'm disappointed that with all this money coming in we we're still having these problems we're still have, having these challenges but here's an opportunity for us to work together as as you mentioned with age strong with immigrant advancement with BHA with Tech Goes Home that does outstanding work, with language and communication access, with our communities of color, with district councilors, at-large councilors, to make sure everybody is able to participate in, in, in this field. Because if you don't have access to a computer, um, you, you have limited access to a, a, a future for you and your family. So, so my question is, you are here today, do you have enough money in the budget that persons with disabilities, communities of color, seniors, immigrants, and BHA, are they going to now have access to um, digital equity like everybody else? Because this is a budget hearing meeting, and I want to make sure that we have the money to accomplish this goal. My short answer would be, we, with the data that we have from the assessment and the combination of the external resources and the money that we have in the budget, we have a good chance of making a dent in the problem in the next year. Um, again, partly because the issue becomes more, it's not a, it might not be a technology issue, it might be a cultural issue, it might be an issue that you feel intimidated by having to deal with a provider. Um, it becomes much more complex. That's where uh, I'm an engineer to a default, so uh, promising a certain level of performance without all the information gives me pause. But I think that it is a good budget. There is, there's a lot of work to be done, as you have pointed out. Um, I think that the, the budget puts us in a position that we can move forward. There's a lot of resources fr from the federal standpoint. A lot of the big money is just about to come out. So, I know that the need is now, but we're in a position where we can try to leverage a lot of those funds to make that problem uh, go. Well, here, here's my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Do it needs to partner with Age Strong, with BHA, Immig Immigrant Advancement, Language and Communication Access, the, the new task force on black men and, and black boys, um, other organizations, nonprofits, so everybody is able to participate equally in uh, digital equity. And if we don't have enough money in the budget, I would like for someone to tell us that so, so we can advocate for more money in the budget. I just don't want someone coming back in another year and saying, oh, Council Flynn, we weren't able to accomplish that because we just ran out of money. Um, so if I know that's the possible conversation now, um, that could take place in the future. Let, let's, let's, see, let's see how we accomplish this, yeah. because it's that critical. If you're an immigrant trying to access the, um, your BPS studies and, and you're not able to access, you're not able to log on, you know, you're at a terrible disadvantage than some wealthier student. Yeah. So I really need a commitment that we're able to help that immigrant student just as the wealthier family has family access in money to have the best digital system they have, I want to make sure that the immigrant families have the same system regardless of if they're able to pay for it or not. Absolutely. And my commitment to you is that let's work together to figure out that we have the sufficient funding to, to address those issues. But that, that it is, and if you look at the other slides that you, the, with your questions. That's why digital equity is number one in our list. But Mike, I don't know if you have. You uh, know. Thanks, Santi. Uh, and thanks, Councillor. You brought it up before. You've been diligent on the effort. I know that we've worked with Castle Square in your district mm -hmm. and uh, Mass Pike Towers as well as other areas. Some of the federal money that is available, that, that fund I said that's not available to all, all of us, but maybe down the line, it's called the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. Ton of money there. 
the one window of opportunity for us are MDUs, big buildings. So the BHA is looking at that. Some of the CDCs are looking at that. Uh, currently, Urban Edge is way ahead of everybody else, but I hope others follow that lead because there will be federal money available for them to do the big challenge, which is the inside wiring mm -hmm. in those buildings. That's the big obstacle in, in those buildings. Now, I just want to throw some numbers at you because Sati said earlier that it is estimated through the census ACS that there are 35,000 households without access in Boston. In the last year, 23,000 have signed up for affordable connectivity program. 27,000 have internet essentials. Tech Goes Home provided service for 3,000. Boston Public Library won a $12 million grant to provide 3,000 hotspots and home routers. And BPS delivered internet essentials for 3,000 families. Well, that adds up to 49,000. There's double counting here, I know. But I think it shows you or illustrates in a kind of a back of the envelope way the progress that we have made in just one year. No, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I, again, want to highlight the, the important work Do It is doing and has done and will continue to do. I just want us to make sure that we're working together going forward, that everybody is able to have equal access. You know, I see kids, I, I, see, I saw a young kid in Chinatown trying to um, do his college application on the internet and uh, the, the system crashed on him. Um, so he's, he's asking me, you know, how, do, how, does he, how does he complete his application? And I, I mentioned that, I said maybe, you know, well, let's go to the public library and do it. And that's, that's a short term answer. But the, the long-term answer is making sure that that apartment building, large apartment building in Chinatown, has the same access as any other residents. But again, want to say thank you to the DOA team that's here for your important work. And thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me an extra minute. Thank you so much, uh, Council President Flynn. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, Madam Chair. And I, I'm going to focus my first set of questions on digital equity. And then I have a few program level questions, but it'll probably be the second round. Um, so can you give me a little bit better understanding, I guess, is there any chance that we could actually demonstrate that some of our parts of the city, don't, aren't, people are not receiving the speeds that they're promised by the ISPs and therefore be eligible for some of the federal dollars focused on access? Yes. So I, I can give a seven then, maybe by seven to Mike, following the pattern. Um, there, part of the CTC assessment focus on actual testing, and again, the, you know, this the what the what the providers promise is never quite ex exactly what is delivered partly because it's a shared resource, right? So, like when everybody is on at the same time, the actual problem. That's why I never l download a large file on Sunday evening when everybody's watching movies before going. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's true. So um, there is some level of assessment. There has been a shift even in the past year around the service level that people have been providing. There are, at the risk of going on a limb, one issue that, as, an like, as someone who studied engineering and studied this, um, the uplink speed, so the, Treasury, the Department of Treasury identified that for a family that is telecommuting and, and studying remotely for, I think, family four, you need 100 megabits downlink, 100 megabits uplink. Right now, most of the providers, you know, like, and that's just because that's the way that people have consumed internet in the past is they over-prioritize the downlink and not necessarily the uplink. Um, there's now with Zoom and with remote instruction and quizzes and all sorts of stuff, there's other technical issues that have become salient around equity, like uh, lag is important. Um, and jitter, like the quality of like the streaming of the service is important as well. So those are pieces that I that are starting to become kind of at the forefront of, of the question. So we're starting that, unfortunately, as, as Mike pointed out before, the federal government and its ruling really did prioritize just like even being able to get a provider in your home rather than looking at some of these other kind of more nuanced uh, pieces. I don't know if Mike could do. I missed the boat or um, there's something. Santi else. has given the answer. And uh, I will mention now that uh, Internet Essentials, the product that's offered by Comcast, used to be a uh, what we call a 25 down, three up service. I think it's now somewhere 50, around 5010 or 5020. So they have increased that service. 
But, uh, Council, the, the, what you're really talking about, I think, is the people who are using, like, a wireless router or a hotspot or maybe uh, tethering to their phone or something like that. That level of service will not really give you a rod, robust broadband connection. It's not really defined as broadband. It gets you connected, but it won't allow a uh, learning experience or a work experience, um, and that's a challenge. Uh, sometimes it's also people's preference. They're on the they're on the road more than they're in their home. You know, that's what, I'm not that's, trying to oversimplify. No, it, but I think that that's what like you you what you mentioned what the map shows and a little bit of what Mike's perspective is. Because we know that a lot of the low-income families that are not getting the service that they need tend to be in certain communities, tend to be in afford some sort of affordable housing and whatnot, that if we target our interventions to increase the availability and the quality of the speed in those developments, and there might be funding opportunities to get that solved. And we, that's where I think, I would say, I think that we need to focus our efforts. Yeah, and, and my anxiety is just that um, I feel like there's a risk that even the federal government's support and I think I've said this to Mike before in the pandemic, is going to like giving basically people second class access. Mm -hmm. And then we're saying like, oh, everyone has access, but like really you, I mean, and we know, we know at the top of the economic world that like literally financial companies are citing themselves to be like a little bit closer to really excellent fiber. And I just feel like then we've got like people at the tail end who are of these really spotty bad setups and then we're sort of saying, oh, now we provided you. So then there's a, the scariest thing for me is a world in which we provide a permanent federal subsidy of 30 bucks a month for our providers to provide substandard, not up to the mm -hmm. contemporary needs service to low income people. Like, so that's where it feels to me like really pushing on what's the actual quality of what we're delivering to people is really important. Absolutely. No, and, and also important work to do an advocacy to the federal government who does has the ability of regulating some of those other pieces. Yeah, and, and I'd love to follow up more on some of the levers that um, you mentioned, by the way, Mike, in terms of like how to get, how to expand um, uh, ACP mm -hmm. uh, eligibility and access, because that seems important. Um, but just because time is short, um, the, the deal that we have where we can't provide, uh, we can't use our fiber to, pr to provide basically like, you know, cheap internet to families in the city of Boston. Could we provide free internet to families in the city of Boston? Well, we do initially, uh, I apologize, Sanchez. we Don't do go initially ahead. through, uh, we could free Wi-Fi, for instance. Right, but I mean. And then I, if somebody were to engage in like community broadband and they were not yeah. selling it, but yeah. they were giving it to say their residents. Yeah. I'd say that's a window of opportunity. Okay. There would, there would be a fight. Sure, but I don't we, mind. We that. love fights. Yeah, exactly. We love fights. Just because you know, I think I still think we should be doing that for everybody in BHA, um, and I think that there are ways to think about BPS and yeah. Counselor, so, you brought up BHA. Uh, uh, we're, we're pleased to announce that we have connected every BHA facility in the city, which was which was kind of a huge thing because they're not actually part of our city government, but we spent our capital dollars to make sure that happened, and they are now deploying wireless within those buildings. It's been fun working with them. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome, and that was a really good thing that we got done last year. Um, can you talk a little bit, speaking of things that we funded last year, about how the study on municipal broadband ended up going, what you did with that? Uh, I think Santi had addressed it. I think we'll probably see it within a couple of weeks. Yeah. Okay, so that is the yes. that is the study right. that you guys That is the, okay. yeah. It's been, it's in the final draft form. We will share with the council, and if you want to have a, Committee. Yes, but I, I imagine we will. <laughs> we, we can dig into and even bring the, the people that, that performed the study and have community meetings. Um, yes. And the two pieces of that study, uh, there were probably four or five pieces to the study, but the two remaining pieces will be, and you had mentioned them earlier, were speed tests. We will, um, CTC will, will host on our, our website a, a speed test for any resident to sort of check their throughput from their home. In addition to that, we will take probably two per neighborhood, or roughly around two dozen uh, homes, and do a long-term test, put a little Raspberry Pi unit That's in their house times. to track as much detail as we can. And we will probably use city staff or council staff or anybody to use it so that we have like great communication going back and forth, because that's a long and iterative process that will probably run about nine months. Okay, great to understand. And then on this, on the application with the state, I mean, are we, are we aligned with the state? What's our state? I mean, it's sort of frustrating not to be able to apply as our own entity. 
So yeah, the the federal government made it a requirement that the state is the entity that's no, eligible to No, we have to live to, with but, it. I understand. But that. we are, <laughs> but we are working with them, and we envisioned that based on all of the work that we've done and the preparation that we've done over the past few years puts us in a really good position to help work collaboratively with the state to deliver the things that we know that we need. Okay, but are we in communication with them yet? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you, I heard that's my time. So as I said, I have some department questions for the next round. Thank you, Madam Chair. You have Chair. a couple of minutes. <laughs> you sure? Yeah. Okay, all right, so um, 311, uh, the need to be able to tie a number of tickets together so that cases can be tracked, it drives our, our folks crazy when duplicate cases get closed by departments. It sort of makes sense in the departments to their flow, but people don't then get a response back. Um, you know, about what actually happened. So like, where are we in that functionality? A second question, I think it's a relatively small thing, but in the code enforcement pay portal, um, we've been chasing, uh, based on sort of a request from a constituent that we dug into and seemed to make a lot of sense, the ability for people to be able to look up their tickets using this like CE number. Basically, people were not being able, like, you know, landlords who had not received the actual physical ticket because they are absentee landlords and then had neighbors dogging them about, oh my God, you've got all these unpaid fines, then can't use the number that's accessible to the neighborhood to look up the tickets and pay them. So a question of kind of adjusting the pay portal there. Um, and then a, a third do it question um, on, oh yeah, so I mean, every time ISD comes in here, we talk about when we're gonna have digitized housing inspections. And they say, we are partnering with Do It on that. And no one will even give me like a timeline in years for it happening. So it's really hard to help support renters in this city with a very low vacancy rate and a lot of power in the hands of landlords when we don't have that data accessible and analyzable. So where are we on all three of those things? So I have a request and then I can give you, so the request is if you don't mind, I would like to give you more detailed answer of script just because they will require talking to some of the principals. I'll, I'll tell you one area of opportunity in Do It that I will be focusing on is trying to bring better visibility into the projects that we're working on to be a better understanding when they get hung up and why they're getting hung up and what do we do to, to bring them to completion. Um, and it's fine, it's, other places struggle with the same thing. We support a lot of users. Uh, my understanding on the first piece, again, I'll give you my <laughs> CIO view three weeks in, so I don't know. There's some challenges with the, with the current system because it's an older version that is not supported and there's some functionality issues and there's some conversations that we're having. The, the funding, there's in the budget, there, because it's a budget hearing, there's funding requested to do an upgrade to the system. The specific functionality that you're talking about, I don't know if the current upgrade provides, but in 311 systems that I've implemented before, there is the possibility of doing that, so something that we can look and prioritize. Uh, I'll look into the second one. It's, I don't quite know. I, I can tell you the name of the system, but I'm not, like that level of nuance may not be able. And then the third one, I know we have a recurring meeting with ISD and their digital transformation, and there are some procurements for the, I, the second answer, there's an RFP that's out for the services for the app to be able to digitize the inspection. So that's in procurement, not implemented yet, and I can try to work on giving you an answer, and hopefully we'll work together to give you a very accurate answer. Great, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is that thank you. Um, I think we'll go to, we have a couple of people signed up for in-person testimony, at Marvin Vinay and Glenn Williams. If you can make your way to the microphone if you're here. Good morning. Good, thank you. Please state your name, affiliation, um, address if uh, you like. And you will be given um, for uh, just two minutes and possibly um, four minutes. Okay, I'll take the four if that'll be allowed. Right. No, just joking. all right. That's a that's a hard concrete four. No problem. Good morning, everyone. Again, Chair Fernandez, Anderson, and Councilors. My name is Marvin Vinay. I'm the Chief Advocacy Officer for a leading Boston-based nonprofit devoted to addressing digital inequity. 
as the committee considers the fiscal year 23 budget for the Department of Innovation and Technology. We want to express our appreciation and support for our continued investment in digital equity through the PEG Access Fund. Digital inequity impacts thousands of individuals and families across Boston, especially those that are already facing systematic barriers resulting from poverty, homelessness, systems, gosh, systematic racism, and more. According to the newly released data, more than 51,000 households in Boston don't have a computer. Nearly 41,000 households don't have broadband, and many more struggle to use these tools effectively. COVID-19 has only magnified these challenges. Supporting TGH through the PEG Access Fund provides those populations with digital devices a year of free, reliable internet connectivity and the culturally responsive skills training they need to access essential services online and capitalize on opportunities presented by the digital world. Just in the past year, 3,100 people in Boston have graduated from TechGo's home courses. 74% of those graduates are black, Latin, Hispanic, and 68% identify as women. 53% speak a, pr a primary language other than English, and 92% have annual household incomes under 50,000. 98% of our TGH graduates report learning skills that will help them improve their lives. 78% who report using digital skills to help their child with school, and 68 who have used digital skills to search for jobs. One out of every two adult graduates report getting a new job, earning a pay raise, entering a work training program, or starting a new business since participating in our programs. This work would not be possible without the steadfast support from the City of Boston and the funding that comes through the PEG Access Fund. The city's commitment to funding digital equity efforts has been essential and effective, but significant needs remain unmet. And more resources are required to continue shrinking and ultimately eliminating the digital divide. With the support of the council and the approval of funding in the PUG Access Fund, TGH and many more of our 100 community partners are eager to continue and expand our work to give more Bostonians the tools and opportunities to fully participate in the digital world. To learn more about it, please see us at techgoeshome.org. Be happy to take any questions if there are any. If not, thank you very much for your opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Verne. Um, next, we have Glenn Williams. Well, good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, everybody. I can't tell you how happy it is to be back inside the building. Good morning. And being able to. Can you please state your name? My name is Glenn Williams. For the record. And I'm the general manager of Boston Neighborhood Network, Boston's nonprofit charitable public access TV and radio provider and fully equipped digital media center. Good morning, Chairperson Fernandez Anderson and counselors. I am proud to be here today on behalf of Boston Neighborhood Network in support of this order to fund the public education and government access service known as PEG that BNN provides to Boston cable viewers and radio listen listeners and residents. Through the dedication of our staff, BNN has fulfilled its commitment to our mission to provide a voice to our citizens and to inform the people of Boston about every aspect of the issues connected to living safely. In addition, we provide our members with free Zoom classes to allow them to continue their programming on both television and radio during this long pandemic we're suffering through. Our continued dedication to the Boston Public Schools, assisting the teachers and students, fulfilling our commitment to the education of our most prized possessions, the future of our youngest citizens. We have accumulated hundreds of Boston Public School approved programs that we continue to air daily. With the addition of institutions like the New, the New England Council, Boston Children's Chorus, the Parkway Adult Orchestra, the Trans Cultural Exchange, Boston University Student Studios, and the Boston Marathon's Jimmy Fund, and our exclusive live television coverage of the St. Patrick's Day Breakfast, we continue to provide the citizens of Boston exciting coverage of what it means to be a Bostonian. 
In addition, with the, maintain, with the maintained Boston University Wheelock Social Justice and Equity webinar series, Friendship Works Senior Living Programs, Massachusetts College of Art and Design, and contributions from the Boston, contributions from the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, from the Center of Virology and Vaccine Research, we continue to provide our neighborhoods with the information needed to make the decisions to enhance their lives. In recognition, I, rec I recognize that some of you have been on BNN programs, sometimes with me as a host. It's always been fun to have you there. I hope that you all recognize the enormous contribution BNN has made to the community of Boston. I have been associated with Boston Neighborhood Network for 25 years as a television radio host and producer, member and president of the Board of Directions, Directors, and now General Manager. I have seen this organization grow into the award-winning Access Media Center it is today. I am very, very proud to let you know that for the second year in a row, we have been awarded with the most outstanding community radio station in the country. It's something that we're very, very proud of. At the end of the year, we lost our neighborhood network news people. Chris Lovett retired, well-deserved retirement after 34 years. But I'm so happy to let you know that within days, we will have our news back up and running on our stations. With our many partnerships, BNN Media will also continue to provide engineering and technical support to Boston's PEG channels, including Boston City TV Council, uh, Boston City TV, Council TV, and the Boston Kids and Family TV. And of course, our radio station, which we are extremely proud of. On behalf of BNN, I thank Mayor Michelle Wu, the Council, uh, incoming Chief Information Officer. It's a pleasure, we'll meet in a minute, I'm sure. Uh, Mike Lynch and everyone at Do It. And Justice, Justin Petty, President of the Board of Directors, for your commitment and sustaining BNN. A place for Boston residents to create local programming for the good of their neighbors. Without the support of the city of Boston, throughout its cable and LP FM license, we would not be able to serve as many people in the city as we have over the years. Thank you very much for your, your, your attention and moments. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Good morning. Can you, can um, you, good morning. Can you hear us? Good morning. Are you speaking to me? Yes. Fantastic. Um, good morning, folks. My name is Kate Crockford. Um, I'm the director of the Technology for Liberty program at the ACLU of Massachusetts. And I'm very happy to be speaking to the council today about a critical issue, which is providing sufficient funding to the technology department to facilitate the city's provision of uh, remote participation in public meetings beyond the pandemic. Um, this is an issue that we and our coalition members have spoken to the council about before. Um, last council session, uh, Councilor, then Councilor Lydia Edwards filed legislation that would require on an ongoing basis beyond the pandemic, the city to um, provide folks from the public with an opportunity not only to view meetings remotely, but to participate in them just the way that I'm doing right now. Um, and uh, due to elections and lots of other stuff that was going on last session, that legislation did not move despite having a very uh, successful hearing. Um, this session, similar legislation has been filed again by Councillor Braden, and um, most councillors have signed on in support of that legislation. So I'm just here today to say that in, you know, we're hopeful that the council will pass that legislation this session, but that in order for it to be meaningful and to be implemented, the city needs to allocate sufficient funding to the technology department to make sure that all of the systems are in place 
uh, to facilitate remote participation in public meetings, not only for the city council, but also for other um, government bodies that hold important open meetings in the city of Boston. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I do have uh, more questions and then we'll give um, Council Braden has to re leave at 12 o'clock. So um, Council Braden, actually, do, did you want to go first? I mean, not that your questions will take a half hour. Thank you, Madam Chair. That would be very, very helpful. <laughs> okay. um, I have a few, a few different things. Um, you know, this, the federal census last year in 2020, there was a big undercount. Um, I think in Alston Brighton, we estimate it's about 5,000 5, people less than actually live there. And uh, the city of Boston has a street and address management system. Um, we're wondering how the, the system is updated to integrate updates such as new development. Um, uh, and our land use and occupancy data transferred from the BPDA inspectional services and the zoning board of appeal so that we integrate all that information and have good data like an undercount in the census has really serious implications for the revenue that we get from the federal government so it's something we hope we can we can correct um, and then in terms of what's the city's involvement in partnerships with data sharing with other municipalities and the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth and adapting standard practices such as using the mass GIS system so that uh, we, we have really good accurate um, information um, and then the other questions I had where I have them on my phone here um, so the land use and development and permitting data and analysis of all fall under the analytics team um, and development you know out in Alston Brighton we just every day this, this new development changes the landscape really 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 dramatically um, and we really need to have make sure it's again related back to the census uh, undercount to really make sure we have the tools to keep up to speed with all of that um, and it has implications we were really hoping to have, you know, with a new uh, um, direct chief planner for the city that we make sure that we have the systems in place to, to really help um, give them the tools to do the job well. Uh, demographic analysis um, did analyze the intersectional issues that touch the work of every single department. Um, the council has been re requesting disaggregated data for, by council district. Very often we get a, just a big lump, like we get data that applies to the whole city and it's not that meaningful if we can't break it down into district uh, and census tract. Uh, so, and neighborhood. Um, so is that capacity, it seems that we can't depend on the, the BPDA for that information. So that's something that we'd really like to see that capacity. Uh, we get sort of surface level information, but it's very difficult to get disaggregated information. Um, and then the city council has switched from to a new legislative management system last year from SIRE uh, to Leg Legis Legistar, um, but it's not, not all the past archival council documents have been have migrated and are not, a, are not available. Um, and I was just wondering if you're aware of that and is there a fix that we can implement to, to make it access accessibility to uh, archival documents in the new system, the new legislative system. Um, and I'm wondering, um, you know, in terms of the data analytics department, um, which also focuses, is there a need to have a separate data analytics department that focuses on demographic population statistics and mapping, um, you know, so that Again, we can disaggregate all that information and get 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 a better picture of what's actually happening at a, at a more micro level in the city. Um, and then further to Kate's um, comments earlier uh, with regard to the remote participation ordinance, I'm, I'm I've refiled that ordinance, and we hope that uh, we can um, continue to promote allow remote access for us and it's really critically important for elders people with young families and also very important for our, our residents with disabilities so that they can access and participate in civic civic uh, conversation 
uh, if they're not able to actually come into the chamber to uh, or attend meetings. So I'd love to know where, what were the um, uh, the preliminary findings? You know, uh, how how what what technology upgrades do we need, and and where how how ex how possible is that? And from your do-it perspective to support that an initiative. We did it during COVID. We managed to have an incredible increase, like in some districts, like a 700% increase in, in civic participation and community meetings. And we're just wondering uh, where we're at with that. And those are really all my questions. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. I don't expect the answers all today, but you know, I'd, I'd like to just put those on the record and, and have your feedback on those issues. Yeah, hi, um, this is Sarah Figalora, uh, Chief of Staff. I'm happy to take on kind of, this is going a little out of order, but it seems um, there's kind of the Granicus piece, which is legislative management piece, remote participation, and then I'll um, kind of hand it over for the data and analytics questions. So the short answer to your question is over the next few months, all of the legislative management system data, not only just from SIRE, not only the stuff that we've done since the moving over to the new system, but stuff from even before SIRE will be all in one place, which is the ultimate goal. The goal is that constituents do not need to go out of their way to track down information that happened here. We are currently in the process of doing that migration, so that should start in July. I can confirm that we check in every few weeks with this vendor to make sure that this transfer is happening because that is kind of the ultimate priority right now, making sure that people have access to the information that they want to find. The previous information, the stuff we're transferring right now, still lives in Sire, which is not a good user experience. People have to go to a separate link. The file sometimes, the server that they sit on is older just by nature of what the application can support because the application is no longer supported. So. Short answer is we are aware of the issue, we are actively working on it, and this should not be an issue in about two or three months, depending on how quickly we can get that data migrated. Very good, thank you. So that's the Granicus piece. On remote participation, I think there's, there's a lot to unpack there, but I just want to make it kind of super clear that we have done a lot of creative work and we are so open to finding creative solutions to make sure that all residents can participate in remote meetings. You know, some of these solutions don't need to be super, super high tech, like a webcam on a screen that everybody can see, yeah. kind of the ability to leverage things like Zoom, which we're already using. Our cable and broadband office is in many conversations with different groups um, about how to do this. So. I know that's not the perfect answer of how we will do this kind of moving forward, but there's a lot of exploring to do about the best way to do it because it's not, it's a technology pro like process, but it's also, you know, a workflow meeting process, making sure people have the tools that they need to access the meeting remotely. But our end goal is to make sure that constituents can engage with public meetings however they want to, whether that is from home, whether that is in person, whether that's a hybrid model. And I'll take it over for the other questions, or if um, anybody has a yeah, uh, uh, And we'll craft the more detailed responses, but broadly, as we mentioned, the GIS data and the SAM, the, the street management mm -hmm. uh, system is something that is under our purview and it's a big responsibility. The GIS team is in this process of being kind of rebuilt. We hired a new GIS coordinator who actually was in doing GIS for B BPDA uh, previously. So we're in the process of, there's a lot, there's opportunities for improvement in, in the workflow, but I even just in the three weeks that I've been here, I've already been able to witness, so I've been added to some of the email threads around how the, to your point, all the way from new development to the street, uh, the address management system, how does it make through? So you can't actually pull some permits without the street being uh, in the system of record. So it's, uh, it's Good. both for the census part, but also from an operational standpoint, it's a, uh, it's a critical piece. So we'll, we'll continue to work on that. I know that there's um, a fair amount of work on line and permitting you, data that the data team is working on and to uh, the other council person's question before, I believe that they're in the process of getting the code enforcement uh, citation numbers into the data so that people can look at it. Um, I don't have 
full clarity into the it's week three uh, of, but I'll, I'll, around, I'll <laughs> around the data sharing agreements. But I know that on some areas, for instance, on cybersecurity and infrastructure, we collaborate and some of the great people that happen to be on the stand there, our chief information security officer and our chief technology officer work and coordinate with a number of municipalities and on ensuring that on the data side, not entirely sure, but we'll follow up on that. Um, and yeah, there, so far like what I've been trying to do is, and that's probably what the presentation that I was trying, there's, we're in a large organization with kind of federated responsibilities and some groups have certain responsibilities and the, and the reality is that with a new mayor and a new administration, probably some of those things might change where the boundaries or the, that we could work at defining the boundaries better so that we don't drop the ball. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll look forward to working with those on you and I'd, I'd, I'd love to meet with all of the council members okay. in person to understand a little bit some of those things that are concerns and areas of improvement. Yeah, hopefully when we get budget, budget done and dusted, we'll be able to have those meetings and yeah. catch up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. Um, in regards to data and, and analytics, um, you say that you're, by using data, you can focus our time and money in areas in the city of Boston where we can aid, where aid is needed most. Um, can you tell us how you have gone about doing this? So I can tell you a little bit about what the department has done historically, obviously, me taking credit for anything in three weeks would be not very accurate. Um, there's a lot of work around performance management and data analytics that has been done. And I think that if you go to the website, you could see City Score, which was this program that the previous chief of staff and the previous administration were using data to understand the performance of different city services. And that's in the website, different residents can access it. Um, we share the data that we have through the open data portal. There are gaps in the sense that Literally, the term that you use for data in, a machine, in an open data portal is machine readable data, but just because a machine can read it and process it doesn't mean that it means anything to anyone. So there's, there's some opportunities to improve being able to share data about the operations and what's happening within the city to the council and to the public. So that seems to be an area of, of improvement that I think that we can work on. Um, Hopefully that answered your question. City, City Score and the performance management program is the place where the, a lot of you, the use of the data for operational improvement occurs. And if you want, I can follow up and get more information about how the performance management program has been used in the past. But Are there concrete metrics and data available um, that document your work in our, this regard? Our work. Uh, yes, I mean, if... Your work in, as in plural, sure. Yeah, yeah, the, the, so you're asking about what are the performance metrics of the performance improvement program? Is that a fair? No, I'm asking concrete metrics in terms of what you just, just stated, that you use analytics to ensure that... We, I asked that first, and then I wanted to know if you had actual... if you had documented this. Again, what I can follow up, the, the data, again, I, I, what I can tell you is that we've, the city of Boston has a long history of using data from departments to improve operational decisions and to bring up, like management decisions all the way to the mayor's office. Um, that's what city score is. Specifically, demonstration of projects and impacts around projects. I don't have the information about that because it happened before I arrived, so I w don't have the information for you. To your I, knowledge, do you know if the department has been doing that? Yeah, that's what the, the, there's a there's a function and they've been doing that. I would. Uh, sorry, you seem to have another question. No, no, you, you. I I just felt felt like you said two things. So. You said you don't have it because you just got here. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I, I'm, I, I think out loud. So I'm processing. Yes, yeah, I was agreeing with you. Yes, I. Uh huh. Yes. And so I'm asking you do you have concrete metrics or data? First, you said no, that you don't have it. And then I asked you if the department has it because you, are, you just got here. And then you said, yeah, they've been doing that. So I, I, if you have it, 
I am asking you as a chair to provide it. Well, there should be examples of some of this work on the Analyze Boston section of Boston.gov. Can, can you please submit it? Can you email it to us? Can yes, you we can definitely thank you. follow up with concrete examples. Oh, I really thank you. appreciate thank you, that. Thank you, thank you. And I apologize, like I'm no, trying to fine. understand the <laughs> You're the totally questions. fine. You're fine. We just, uh, we'll get there. Um, so currently, can you tell me how much, how many languages on the, on the uh, like on the website itself? I, I don't know. I know that I'm hearing 12, sometimes I hear eight, but specifically, do you know how so, many? So the Boston.gov is currently enabled through Google Translate in a variety of oh. different languages, but we are in the process of working, um, and it's a teamwork and I'll answer hopefully the, your previous question as well. But we're in the process of working with 311 and other teams to bring the 311 experience in 10 languages. There's some challenges. So um, it also answers you, a previous question you had about like how is it that a resident interacts with the city digitally? So that's one area. So that the mobile app, like if a resident that speaks uh, Mandarin wants to submit a ticket in Mandarin, that they're able to do it in their native language we're, we're still working through it, so I think that the, there's some level of that functionality that we hope to release later in the summer. Um, um, I, I, I can follow up, um, kind of, so we, Boston.gov is, is available via the mm -hmm. Google Translate in those languages. We do work really closely with language and communications access to ensure that information that is, you know, vital to the community, all information is, but we, we kind of target our funding to make sure that things are translated in 12 languages, in the top 12 languages other than English. So that includes our COVID resources, our affordable connectivity program resources. Uh, so just, it, it's a combination of kind of the site being translated, but ensuring that we're in really close par partnership with, like, with LCA. Thank you. In your um, vendors, you listed MBE contracts, and of, of those five that you listed, one in Roxbury, but the other four are the same. It looks like the same company. Yes, the same company, um, SHI International Corp. And you use them, you listed them for, for diff four different contracts, um, one for 773,000 and so on. And the rest are like smaller ones. Um, is there a reason why we're only using one company outside of Boston to, for four different contracts? Are we not able to find anything else in Boston? I just want to make sure I'm not stepping on anyone's toes. So, uh, so we follow the equitable procurement rules that are set by purchasing. Um, when it comes to selecting vendors, a lot of the technologies that we source are through statewide contracts. So. Um, the statewide contract that is most relevant to some of the softwares that we procure is ITS 75, and there are multiple SHI and Zones are both minority and women-owned uh, vendors on that contract. So a lot of what we're able to procure has to come through a reseller uh, just because of the way that some of these enterprise agreements are managed. So that's the first piece. The second piece is that some of our uh, spend with diverse data is not captured in that list because it is indirect spend. So every vendor or almost every vendor that is on a statewide contract also has an obligation to spend a portion of the revenue that they earn from their work on that contract with a diverse vendor. So the roughly four, $3.8 million that you see with as direct spend with minority vendors, minority and women owned vendors, is supplemented by another 1.2 plus indirect spend that is also through those statewide contracts with diverse vendors as well. So that's the statewide piece. And then the equitable procurement vendor directory also gives us options. Um, we're still trying to sort through folks who can actually meet our needs, right? Because we're talking about a range of different technologies, some of which are brand new, right? Which have a more diverse set of providers, some of which are on the legacy side, which have entrenched enterprise companies that, again, might fall into the indirect diverse vendor category, but are themselves not necessarily categorized as diverse vendors. Thank you. Um, 
I, I understand what you're saying. I just, I'm having trouble with, you know, uh, SHI International Corp is white owned, but woman owned, I, I understand, but outside of Boston. But the only black owned or minority owned uh, contract that you have here listed for what you gave me is $33,000 in Roxbury. And I guess I'm just trying to figure out if we could do more to contract vendors inside of Boston one and obviously more MBEs contracts. And what if we if we haven't started working on that, you know, that we, you know, are you are you thinking about doing something about that or is there effort to creating maybe technical assistance so people can access these grants or opportunities? I, I can comment. Yes, there is room for improvement. Similar to there's room for improvement on the staffing level. Um, the technology space is um, generally has structural issues around equity and diversity. Um, it is so they're you know like they're, as Zach pointed out you know like we we're buying Google. Uh, the G Suite, right, Gmail and whatnot, there's only a few companies that are able to provide email service at that scale, and they're not necessarily kind of minority-owned businesses or large corporations. Um, so, there, but there are opportunities, especially around the kind of smaller contracting. I think that there's some really good opportunities. There's other offices like in economic opportunity um, in the city that are doing work around promoting technology for black men, for um, women, for others, that I think that it's a matter of, there's opportunities of connecting the dots of people that are graduating, coming out of those programs, whether they become vendors or they become employees with the department, whether maybe we give them an opportunity for apprenticeship for, for so there are, that that's would be where I would start, but again, I'm still trying to figure out what the plan move forward. And it is something that I care personally about and that we all care a lot about. Thank you. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, yeah, and just putting on the record, I'd love to have a follow-up about what the 311 upgrade does entail in terms of functionality, because I know we have a wish list. I already mentioned combining the duplicate cases, but I think, you know, people being able to, like, having a system where departments can provide some kind of um, automatic notification when it's a type of work, for instance, that doesn't happen in the winter. We get a lot, I think, like, we don't communicate back to people like, oh, you filled out a brickwork case, but we're not going to do that till the temperature is above whatever. So just heads up, it's not going to be dealt with by a couple of year for a couple of months. Um, and with things like that, departments tend to have like some will leave it open, some will like shut things. Yeah, I just think that there's, a, there's some more communication, some more estimation on completion. We have all this data, right? Places where we could tell people, yeah, that's probably going to take a couple of weeks, or that's. It's just like I think would make a make a big difference, and it would also be nice to have a more um, set standard of a sort of like after photo. We have that in the. Um, I would say the pothole team is the best at that, but not everybody does that, and so again, it's hard for people to know whether a case has been closed because it's really been resolved or not. Um, so just would love to better understand what the planned functionality is and obviously would urge that we fit as many of the functions that people have been yearning for into an upgrade as possible. Um, and would love to follow up on this code enforcement pay portal fix and on where the timing is on the ISD housing piece. And it would also be great to get the map that you guys put in the presentation in an actual GIS format such that one can look at the census tracks, not just by like holding it up against a census track map. And also because the wicked we free Wi-Fi red dots, well, great in that they demonstrate that we've concentrated a lot of them in Councilor Fernandez Anderson's district where there's also low, like a, a high number of people who don't have that broadband access. Like I thought it was great to see that on the map, but it also makes it literally hard to see the color of the tracks underneath. So I think if we could get that, that yeah. would be great. Um, yeah, absolutely. The the map I made my second day just to, that, and I, I did it in our GIS Pro, so it is in GIS and we can talk a little bit more. And, and again, if there's needs for sharing resources with the council offices so that you can be able to use some of these tools, uh, you know, they're yeah. your tools, so you're, you're our clients as well. We wanna make sure that we're in, enabling you to do this stuff. I think with some of the through and one functionality that you mentioned, so we'd love to get the, the list of requests Here's, overall, this is my editorial, there's 
some of the pieces that you're mentioning, right, are not specific about the technology, but their business processes, right? About the decision to close the ticket or not close the ticket, and what status do you close the ticket, and how we communicate to residents about like this contextual, right? Like we're not gonna fix that pothole because we're about to resurface the entire road. And things like that, this is where I think that there's also some opportunity and do it. Like we're very technology heavy, but the reality is just like a Fitbit doesn't make you fit. Like a working plan supported by a Fitbit make, you know, allows you to embark on that. There's, there's room to make some of those, some of that work. And you know, similarly, the, the procurement and HR equity information that, you, that is being used in these meetings is provided through the system that we maintain with base, through the analytics that we provide, and it's helping us address those issues. So again, it's going in and matching the business process and the work across multiple departments. We only hold one of the pieces that makes this. Totally. But we look forward to working with that. Yeah. On the, and I would love, if you have a and, wish list, I would I, love to see I it. And I think, you know, and that's one of the reasons that, um, it's a different committee, so I won't dwell on it, but I think like, that's one of the reasons that we sort of talk about city services and innovation technology, because I think the most frustrating thing for the council is, that, is when you talk to departments and they say, well, we really need do it to fix that thing. And then you talk to do it and they say, well, really the department has a business process issue they need to figure out. And what neither the counselors nor the people we want to represent, that we're representing, right, want is sort of getting passed around on that. But I think you're totally right, right? It's a, it's a united conversation, it has to be, and so, understanding a little bit better some of those challenges yeah. like would be, yeah. And, and I think that there are services that we could provide that would help support departments that are undergoing those, those transformations. And the buck stops with us and it is our responsibility to make it work collectively. So, um, we yeah. just, but it would be great to understand some of those uh, kind of wish lists or functional requirements in tech speak. Yeah, and then um, a, a couple things. Just it would, did we succeed at all, Mike, in getting the providers to like simplify those applications for the ACP? Like, I know that people have to do it to the provider, but I do feel like we could put some pressure on the providers to make the actual process of sign up easier. Besides, besides deploying our efforts to support people signing up. Uh, yes and no, Councillor. Um the form is the form. It's a, it's the FCC form. They the took FCC the form. lifeline form and they kind of just backed into it. So it, it's it's kludgy. It's an old legacy system. It is what it is. On the other hand, uh, we did get commitments from Comcast, Verizon, and all the wireless companies that as we do outreach, we will notify them and if they can, they will attend. So the two-step process becomes less onerous. So we can help someone fill out the form and they will be there to direct them towards the equipment and the, the service that they're looking for. Do they want cable modem service on the house? Do they want a wireless facility, et cetera? Not sure how well that's gonna work out, but that's the goal right now to try to bring them together. Lastly, the only, um, the only advantage some citizens have is if you are already a Lifeline recipient, hmm. it's a one button approval and you're all set. So that's, that's, that do, was something that the FCC Do we have any sense up. of what proportion of our people are in that bucket? I think, I think some of the early seven to 10,000 were in that bucket. We're in that bucket. Because I think the providers yeah. actually reached out to them and said, you know. Right, yeah. right, but that just means it's gonna be incrementally harder to get the additional half but of the people it, who it, aren't. It doesn't mean that they are not eligible and deserving of that yeah. extra benefit. No, absolutely. And then, um, Santi, can you just speak, uh, sorry, Chief, uh, just a little bit to how we get competitive on talent, I mean, it just strikes me, we have a very in-person digital world here, a lot of digital companies, everyone gets to stay working remotely, um, salaries are going through the roof on the private side, it means that when we're competing for diverse talent, the whole industry is competing for diverse talent, like how, what are, how are we gonna crack that? It's tough, um, and it's a very competitive environment, and some jobs in tech are starting at initial starting salary over $250,000. And obviously because the issue of equity is faced by everyone and every, uh, increasing, not quite everybody, but an increasing number of companies and groups care about it. Um, I think two pieces. The first one is, 
I know that we're working in partnership with other departments to understand the possibility of hybrid work where we're able to enable people from having some flexibility. I think that they'll be helpful. Um, Secondly, there's well, there's more pieces to, to dig into, but you know, I do this job because I love the impact. There's some things about this job that are frustrating and that are very difficult, but there are also some very exciting things that, I, that, that provide an opportunity for someone. You know, I'm an immigrant, like I'm here in Boston City Council. <laughs> it's kind of surreal, well like I'm here like helping drive the, the, the technology decisions, because they're meaningful, they're impactful things, and I think that to the end that we can m make sure that we give that experience to people. Um, just finish with a quick story. One of my, my first intern ever was a person who was studying uh, computer science at a college in South Bend, and he also happened to work in the kitchen at Chipotle, and no one would give him a technology job because he had no experience. So I hired him as my intern and gave him experience building the SharePoint for the group that I was with. And a month later, he got hired by the school corporation as a network engineer, and then he went to work for Accenture. It's awesome. But so it's like, I think like finding the gap of being the place where we are the entry level, where we can bring people in, it's a, it's a hard competitive environment. And there's reasons why these jobs are tough to you know, pay. Comparatively, they're, they're, yeah, right. they're great. They're well, yeah, things. whatever we can do on hybrid, I think, and also comp and class stuff would be helpful. And um, I know my time's over, so I'll just say that we need webcams for all the computers at the council. It's ludicrous that this far into the pandemic, my staff have to like pass their one webcam along. It was fine as an interim measure, um, but I think we've been a little bit left behind. So since we're one of those departments serviced by you all, just wanted to flag that. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Uh, you're welcome, and I second that. I think uh, my office is experiencing the same thing. Uh, Council Ferry, thank you, and welcome. You have the floor. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Doing okay. Uh, Chief, Chief, and Director in Chief, uh, good morning. And uh, we're actually just over noon, so good afternoon. Uh, appreciate your time and attention to, to this hearing. Uh, a couple of basic questions, that, and if they've already been asked, I uh, appreciate your indulgence just because I was running a little behind. Uh, the status of the rollout for the Bonet high-speed Wi-Fi to all of our Boston public schools. Can someone give me an update on that? Mike can do. Yeah. Yes, sure. Uh, Councillor, with the exception of maybe one or two, uh, it is complete, uh, which is uh, big news. Uh, you, great si news. you signed off for that bond three yep. years ago. So. That's great, Mike. I'm glad that it's done. So one or two schools and, and then uh, expectations. Yeah, those are just the logistics issue right now, so okay. we'll get them. Get them done uh, by the end of the school year or start of... Uh, the yeah, probably semester. before the beginning of next school year. Right. Awesome. And then uh, about 13% of the households do not have Wi-Fi in Boston. What are the strategies that we're deploying to get those uh, houses signed up? Yes. So we uh, shared some some numbers about that. The, 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 maybe Mike would just... Oh, you know, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah so go ahead. <laughs> so you don't have to hear from Yes, Councilor, you're right. Like, there's probably, uh, from the 2020 census, the American Community Survey component of the census, mm -hmm. uh, the assumption is that there's 35,000 households in the city two years ago that did not have access to Internet. Uh, the further assumption is much of that was an affordability issue. They couldn't afford it. Um, since that, and really in this last year, um, 23,000 households have signed up for the Affordable Connectivity Program, a federal program. We work with agencies in the city like Age Strong, Veterans, New Immigrants, Boston Housing to get folks signed up. We hope to use the Digital Equity Fund this year to kind of to give money to nonprofits and community organizations and churches to get their constituents and congregation and clients signed up so that we can make that a larger number. In addition to that, Comcast just recently told us that collectively they have distributed 27,000 subscriptions to Internet Essentials. That's the $10 a month service that they provide in the home. And they've upped the speeds of that. I stand corrected, Councillor Buck, because Tim Kelly texted me in the middle of this hearing. The speeds are, I believe, 100 down and 10 up at this time. And, uh, and then in addition to that, there are three city programs where we fund Tech Goes Home for a million dollars a year, which the council approves, and they are providing approximately 3,100 subscriptions 
to service that might be cable, it might be Verizon, it might be wireless. Uh, the Boston Libraries just won a $12 million grant, sorry, schools and libraries together won a $12 million grant from another federal program called the Emergency Connectivity Fund. And that provides 3,000 hotspots and wireless routers that are targeted through the library to BHA seniors. That's, that's the initial. And, and if there's any left over, then they'll move on to families and, and Section 8 homes, et cetera. And uh, they also, I think, bought 40,000 more Chromebooks for the school department. And lastly, lastly the, we also funded, I believe, uh, 3,000 internet essential units to school families mm -hmm. in the last year through BPS. Right. That's great information, and I was obviously anticipating my, my next question about our marketing, our marketing and outreach efforts, but to recognize yeah, that we have these grants, which is great news, and, uh, and those partnerships that we have, we're blessed. Uh, here in Boston to have so many great uh, you know, business partnerships. Comcast obviously comes to mind, uh, uh, among other companies. Verizon uh, has been very responsive Verizon. as well, Councilor. Good. Verizon uh, made sure that they developed a program to do this. And if you remember during COVID, uh, Verizon, we had some you know, smart city money with them, mm -hmm. an awful lot of it. We spent two and a half million dollars of that money giving hotspots and tablets to great. school kids, veterans, new immigrants, seniors that's great uh, in, in, a, in a really rushed fashion right. and they were very responsive right. and the other wireless companies are they you know make sure they don't sort of fall under the radar when we deal with Comcast and Verizon but there are other wireless companies yes. hopefully they're partnering with us and uh, and helping uh, they are they are divide. equally all eligible for the federal dollars as Perfect. well so great they see what the opportunity is to nice. and Mike thank you for the work you did obviously throughout uh, COVID uh, getting information out to uh, to our residents particularly our most vulnerable residents, updates uh, throughout the COVID process so uh, a lot of folks were getting that um, the most recent up-to-date information uh, you know uh, from our mayor um, you know and it was being broadcast uh, on uh, our cable access so appreciate that and one of our favorite stops um, is BNN and the studios so I know that we have so representatives from there, can you maybe just touch base on that partnership uh, that continues to exist? I love the fact, you and I have had this discussion many years ago. During a previous administration, we were way up in like the nosebleed channels, and I've always asked you to sort of slide us down into the, uh, and we get more feedback across the city, particularly from seniors, now that they can access sort of the local cable access on those channels, I think you're like 9 or 13 in the early stages, as opposed to being on the... I guess the back end or uh, you know extra numbers and the clickers so um, so right, I appreciate counselor, that yeah. and I know it's made a huge difference I knew it was gonna make a difference back then but at that time I knew it was just about one person and one the administration wanted to get uh, all the all the credit and History, the council and BNN was way back at the back of the end of the bus so we want to make sure that yeah. we um, we continue that because that's vital and critical information for our residents and for our citizens, particularly new Bostonians being able to access That's right. information. So, um, and then if you could just, so maybe just touch on that partnership, but also in the budget, we see that uh, in 20 it was, the operating was 446 and then it went down to 383, then it jumped up to 1.7 and now it's went down to seven. So it looks like there was a significant uptick. Was that in equipment upgrades? Uh, where would you see that number sort of inflating like that? And, well, just, while Santi is getting the answer to that question, because I do not know the answer, I'll be happy to jump on the question sure. you ask about PEG access. Uh, right. Glenn Williams is here, as you know. The best. Um, two channels of community, one radio station, the LPFM, both, mm -hmm. uh, all three run out of uh, BNN. Kerry Jordan here is supported as well through BNN mm -hmm. in our office. Uh, you're going to lose Kerry, I understand. Uh, Unfortunately. Uh, our gain is your loss, you but we'll, we'll see what happens down the future. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, the conversation just prior to this was about uh, transparency and engagement with uh, Councilor Braden. And, you know, it's a legacy system, the PEG access system in Boston, but it is, it is stunningly available for citizens. It's five channels of programming that, that can give you pretty much anything you want. They worked very well during COVID. If people were not connected or disconnected, they still had basic TV. They knew how to get to these channels. They could watch the city council. They could watch the ZBA. They could watch uh, some host or Chris Lovett on mm -hmm. NNN. All of these things uh, together contribute. Right. And in the evening hours, we have the LPFM station, um, and that's available as well, right. sort of replays of that stuff. Okay. It continues to exist, yeah. and I think we just added through renewals of the RCN Astound license and the Comcast license, uh, two channels of HD on both platforms. Right. So 
To me, that doesn't mean much, but a lot of people get really excited That's about good. that. And it's an opportunity to give a shout out to the team over at BNN and all the folks that do the hard work. It really is a gem here. And I often think about the late, great Mike Baer, uh, who started over there and saw the real value in you know getting uh, community information out there and among so many other groups and organizations that have taken full advantage of, of uh, the studios over there, which have seen some upgrades, uh, necessary upgrades over the years. but. So to, uh, to you and to the team over there, we really appreciate that. And if just my last question is just we saw it, we see a big spike. Can you just tell me what that was for? Yes, uh, we're looking at the, the specifics, but basically in some of the years, and the, you'll see it next year in some of the applications investments, as we migrate from some systems, sometimes we have to run both the previous system and the new system in parallel just while we're yeah. off board. So that's some of the reasons for spikes. Um, I know there's, you know, like times when we're doing expansion of, the, so I'm just giving you kind of like a high level answer because, sure. and we'll get back to you maybe at a later yeah, that would, date. Yeah, because we're, we're at, so it's a line item, right? And it says non-personnel. Yes. So in 2020, it was $529. Mm -hmm. In 2021, it was $180. In 2022, it was $1.3 million. And then this year, it's 191 So you sort of see where it, uh, it's and there's piece of that that is explained by accounting changes. So there's some pieces that were capital expenses that are going to the operating expenses, and some that are getting reclassified within different items. I, I do know that, but I want to be able to account at the line item yep. to be able to tell you it was this system when we were moving, yep. but we'll we'll be able to to get to. It. But there's some accounting changes, and there, there's sure. also a little bit of what I was telling you about. Uh, yeah, where it's non-personnel, so I'm assuming it's sort of equipment upgrades or it's technological upgrades, and I know I can speak probably for, for Mike and folks at BNN where, you know, some of the stuff is, and even here, um, was very antiquated for the yep. longest period of time. Mike, you remember these discussions, and then finally, we, and then even then, once, you know, you know this world, once you get something new, six months later, it's old, right? Mm -hmm. So we're constantly sort of... Uh, chasing a, a, a tail that continue to be on, on the cutting edge of it. So that's probably what it is, but it is significant and it kind of jumps out at me. So I just, where we go from $180 non-personnel to 1.3, if I could just have something through the chair, uh, just an explanation as to what it is. I'm sure it's justified. I just yeah. want to get my hands around yeah, it. Yeah, most of it is accounting changes, but we'll track them okay. and explain to you what, what was changing. Very good. Thank you, Chief, Chief and Director. And Chief, I appreciate your time to this and uh, you're adding tremendous value to our city. and. You know, continuing to keep us on cutting edge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Um, public, I just have a few questions, and uh, there's a Diana who submitted a video, a short video for testimony. We'll listen to that. Um, anyone um, here who would like to do uh, another round in testimony, uh, you're welcome to. You came all the way down here um, to speak, so. Um, I'm happy to hear from you again if you had something else that you d didn't finish. And then I'll read um, the letters from the absent counselors. Um, for public access television um, uh, that offers some great programming, I've used it. Um, I've actually hosted a show um, on BNN as well. And do you feel there's opportunities to present um, or presented by the budget proposal to strengthen it? And if so, how? Um, yes, uh, Madam Chair. Um, this year, we uh, we will fund. I guess the the PEG access fund will provide pr approximately 3.3 million to BNN. Uh, BNN tries to live carefully within their budget. The last two years, a lot of programming was not being done, so they have a bit of a surplus, which is helping them to expand programming right now. One of the things they wanted to do, uh, Glenn Williams mentions that. Uh, um, Chris Lovett, who had been for decades the, the, the face and uh, delivery of the news on NNN, retired. And a new team has just started. They're sort of kicking the tires and testing things out in the studio right now and hope to launch by, I believe, July, a new news program and experience if they, what they can to do that programming in multiple languages. Uh, it's early days yet. I'm optimistic. They're enthusiastic. And Glenn is very supportive. How does the budget support it? Well, um, we had uh, a renewal in the budget. We, the money that is funded to them, to the PEG Access Fund, is money that comes to BNN from the cable companies. Uh, 
essentially. That's, so we, we're kind of the, the pastor, I guess, mm -hmm. the city, the 21st Century Fund. Uh, this year, we were able to slightly increase that money during renewal. We got some extra dollars from the cable companies to add to their fund. The, the basis for that revenue is subscribership to cable TV, not, not broadband, just cable TV. That's, that's the 3% fee, if you will, um, that contributes to this fund. That is diminishing. People are cutting the cord. Um, it has not impacted us yet here in the city. I think it will soon. Not in this year's budget, maybe not in next year's budget, but after that it will be an issue. Thank you. Um, I would love to see a pipeline created where young people in Boston who are interested in TV production, um, broadcast, film, et cetera, beyond you know, BNN, and I know that there's some programming there, um, could collaborate under your auspices, um, perhaps um, as interns or volunteers or employees. Um, does this something that currently exists? In small ways, it does. We in the summer we take a couple of uh, a couple of Boston High School kids as in as interns and team them up with our college interns, sort of big brother, big sister type routine that works out well. We work closely with Madison Park's um, broadcast journalism program um, with them. Uh, by the way, uh, Tato Walsa, who was on the board of BNN, uh, recently produced a film and used quite a few Madison Park students on that film. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look. She did a great job. It is a full-length feature film, uh, pretty much solely produced by her. She did a remarkable job. And then there are others, I, how do I put this? They are mostly pockets. Uh, Glenn may have some programs as well at BNN, but these are mo mostly pocket initiatives that happen. Uh, I'm thinking Deb Sharif is another producer who has been active with student groups. Uh, Many years ago, Deb was a teacher over at East Boston High School, later went on to teach at a community college, and continues to do this work in her retirement. Um, the Chief of Advocacy of, uh, Officer for Technology Goes Home uh, testified today, uh, Mark Marvin Bonnet, Bonnet. Yes. and did, he mentioned some, some numbers or proposals to what he felt or what he believed he, the program needed in order to be um, in order to, to be sustainable. Yeah. Can, you, can you speak to those proposals? Do you need him to come to the mic to clarify? I, oh, yeah, <laughs> um, I think there may be a hearing next week where we're going to address that. I don't really know. Uh, I thought so, but I might be mistaken. Um, currently, the city of Boston provides through this fund about and, approximately sorry, a million. Sorry, the hearing through Ways and Means? I'm confused. Uh, sorry, the hearing through Ways and Means or maybe ARPA, ARPA. COVID recovery? It may be ARPA. Okay. It's ARPA, yeah. yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, did not realize. Um, thank you, Council Bach. Uh, Mr. Vinay, do you mind um, just sort of on the question, specific questions to the numbers that you were asking? I just wanted to um, have the answers. Which, uh, you have the floor. Um, no, you, you mentioned um, amounts that specifically that you were suggesting, or did you just, were you, were you just saying overall, generally, you mm -hmm. felt that this was a program that needed support? Yes, what we were doing- In we're, your letter, there was some Sure, amounts. absolutely. What we did was we provided data that has been collected from our learners and our uh, instructors, offered that to explain what the process has been and what the outcomes have looked like. Um, also indicating that that still remains a uh, deficit towards the larger community at whole, at, as, as a whole to be able to get access to some of these resources. So, My question, I guess, about the budget is, do you feel that Technology Goes Home is going to get enough uh, funding to do that? I do, Councillor, uh, for, for a couple of reasons. We have, gotcha, um, sorry. in the city of Boston, through this fund, we have supported Tech Goes Home for probably more than 10 years. Uh, Correct. Tech Goes Home physically actually lived in, in the department, in room 703. Correct. For a number of years. Um, over the last two years, I guess, during COVID, um, Tech Goes Home has really benefited from tremendous contributions from different corporations and foundations as people as the issue of digital equity and inclusion got elevated and people wanted to give money to solving this problem. Um, 
Marvin probably has a, a better idea than I do, but Boston has historically maybe been a 100% funder of Tech Goes Home, and I don't know, I guess we're probably one third right now, Marvin? I'm uh, sorry, you, I should address that to the chair. My apologies. Sure, no problem. So, uh, thank you for the history there. Uh, yes, we are. We have been afforded a, probably about a quarter of our budget does come from the city of Boston to the PEG Access Fund. Uh, but as you do know, uh, those resources uh, get immediately allocated to the work, and there's still many out there who are lacking in support that we could provide resources to with additional sources. So. Uh, okay. Thank you. All right. Um, there, I have some questions from my colleagues, and if you can't answer them, just you know, state for the record that you'll submit them. Um, I'm fine with that. We don't have much time left, and I think that my colleagues are waiting for round three. So we'll just uh, read them into record, and if you want to submit them in the interest of time, that's okay, too. Um, from Council Lujan, Dear uh, Committee on Ways and Means, I regret to inform you that I will be unable to attend the Committee on Ways and Means budget hearing on the Department of Innovation and Technology and the Public Education, Government Access and Global um, um, and Cable Fund. In 2022, infor information technology plays a critical and vital role in the seamless operation of, the, of a transparent and accessible government. I have a deep respect for our IT workers who ensure our digital streets are working so that we may go to work. The pandemic and our turn towards remote work and hybrid hearings has shown a bright light on the necessity of a strong IT infrastructure. Here are my four questions. In regards to broadband and digital equity program, what is the status of extending the Boston fiber optic network to connect all of the Boston public schools with high quality, high speed, and reliable internet. Um, second question, what is the status of expanding wicked free Wi-Fi within Boston 20 Main Street District? In regards of cybersecurity in recent years, major American cities, including Baltimore, Atlanta, and Tulsa, as well as multiple school computer networks and IT systems across the country have been attacked, disabled, and in some instances held the, for ransom. In an honest assessment of our cybersecurity infrastructure, what score would you give our level of preparedness and protection against cybersecurity threats, one to 10, with, they be, with one being imminently vulnerable and 10 being impenetrable? Question four, technology often has the potential to leapfrog su successive ser services. For instance, many immigrant families do not use computers, instead relying on phones and tablets. Similarly, many populations do not rely on traditional broadband internet solutions, instead relying on wireless phone and telecommunications data services. What are we doing to reach these populations where they are the, and provide them with the resources they need and are used to. Would you, any of you like to answer these questions or if you, you can submit them as well, it's yeah, up to you. We'll, we'll submit them. I think the, a couple of them we had answered already um, and I'm sure that we can pass the, the answers. Uh, I think that this cybersecurity question would be better to, I don't know, again, I'm in Pittsburgh and other places to do things differently. But uh, because of the sensitivity of it, uh, maybe it'd be better if there is a, an executive session format here to dig into kind of sensitive information that I don't think that we want to broadcast it. But so far, I've been very impressed with our cybersecurity program, spearheaded by a chief information security officer. Um, and then the fourth one, again, we will continue to work with the offices that have the best relationships with those constituencies to try to reach them and uh, evidently there's still opportunities and even working with the council people that know and live in some of these communities have access to them, they trust you, so be able to partner with you all and, and with the, those offices would be a matter. But we'll submit it in writing as well for the council person. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can send them to you as an email form too if you haven't taken any notes. Um, from Councillor Aaron Murphy, dear Madam Chair and members of Ways and Means, 
I am writing to inform you of my absence during today's City Council hearing on docket 0480 to 0486 and 0500 FY23 budget do it peg access fund. A representative from my staff will be listening in and following up with me. I look forward to reviewing the footage and following up as need be. I regret that I am not able to join today, but I am submitting the following questions to be entered into the record with the hopes of getting a response from the administration either during or after the hearing. How are, first question, how are we ensuring, how do we ensure that the city's digital services are accessible to all residents in the city? Under department history in this personnel services section, page 165, online item 51100, can you give insight on what is an emergency employee? Uh, question three, on page 172 in program four, core infrastructure, there is a $3 million increase, dollar increase in the non-personnel services from the fiscal year 2022. Can you elaborate on how this increase amount will in enhance cybersecurity and increase productivity in the core infrastructure? Sincerely, Aaron Murphy. Um, so same, right? So there's a couple of uh, repetitive questions there. Um, we'll submit them all in email and you can respond. Um, can we go to the, our virtual video? Submitted, thank you. Hello, and thank you to the committee for letting me speak on the importance of funding to enable remote access and high. Okay, there we go. Uh, this video is for, from Diana. Hello, uh, and thank you to the com committee for letting me speak on the importance of funding to enable remote access and hybrid meetings in Boston's government. This is a prime example of how innovation and technology can support democracy and civil rights. My name is Diana Hu, chairperson of the Boston Center for Independent Living, software engineer at Google, and motorized wheelchair user since the age of two. I understand very deeply what it means for technology to serve a role in promoting accessibility and equity. And we've seen how COVID has caused so many lockdowns and so many places to become inaccessible. And suddenly there was this common understanding of what inaccessibility meant, whether in the context of a disability or a raging pandemic. And so virtual access to public meetings like this budget hearing, they've emerged as an accessibility accommodation. And in fact, one that the disability community has been calling for for many years before COVID. Remote participation is the latest in a long pattern of universal design, along with curb cuts, elevators, closed captions, audio books, and so many other features that began as accommodations and exploded into universal popularity. And now we have the opportunity to make permanent this universally popular technology that is open to the door to government participation for people with disabilities or chronic health conditions or young children or barriers to travel, just so many groups of people who can be enabled through virtual access to engage with their government in a new and empowering way. This is a just cause for Boston's funds to make remote participation a curb cut 2.0 for the modern day. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Diane Hu, for your video uh, testimony. <clears throat> um, I don't think that we uh, need a round three. Um, I'm not sure if my colleagues are returning, they've left their belongings, but which means they usually have to step out to the restroom or something. But um, I, 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 I don't have any questions and there's no one else here, so we, we can close here. Um, thank you so much for your work. Um, I have to say that I am truly impressed by your ability to um, work on equity in terms of access. Um, 
and in terms of attainability and how uh, accessible things are uh, relative to price, obviously we still have a lot of work to do. Um, but I, I do think that you, your department is uh, super responsive and um, I thank you for your hard work. I know that it's, you know, you're basically the skeleton of the city and you're holding everything together. Um, and if you don't hear that often, I appreciate your work. I am totally impressed by your work and I look forward to working with you and hopefully we can meet on separate terms um, to discuss future collaborations. Thank you so much. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.